Proceed. So at a, at a glance, I'll start with the top left uh, corner. So we have plants with a combined capacity of 2.05 million tons per year. So price is about 1.05 million tons and Johor at 1 million tons. We are, we are production is over a million uh, tons. So we still got a lot of headroom in terms of plant capacity. We control about 60% of the uh, domestic share market. We are the largest standalone uh, sugar refinery uh, to date. Uh, and we believe so in many years to, to come. Uh, we import raw sugar, so we are not integrated. We used to have sugar sugarcane uh, plantation that's in police in the northern side, but we seized the police operation, uh, some of you may know, uh, mid last year. So we import largely from uh, Brazil. Uh, about 75, 80% of our raw sugar is coming from Brazil and the rest from India, Thailand, and a few other countries. And the top, uh, top right corner, we have over 260 uh, customers, mainly wholesalers and major major industries, as well as the uh, SMIs. Uh, we also deal directly. We don't uh, just go through uh, wholesale, uh, let's say, uh, channels, but we also serve directly to uh, major FMCG players, namely FNN, Coca-Cola, Nestle, and so forth. We've got also, besides the uh, cost and uh, fine grains, we've got also value-added products which I will touch upon a little bit more later. And uh, we are today slightly over a thousand uh, employees. Uh, these are purely MSM staff. We have also uh, contractor laborers uh, in operation, a few, a few hundred of them. And we are still over 60% owned by GLC with a group uh, good and strong uh, shareholdings by FGV and, uh, and uh, Felda. So in a nutshell, our business is importation of raw sugar, we refine, package, and we sell domestically as well as exports. Today our exports, today our exports, sorry, today our exports are about 30% uh, of the total volume. Domestic uh, demand in Malaysia is about 1.5. In terms of global ranking, so MSM is a global player. It's a top, top 10 uh, global player, and you can see Wilma, of course, uh, amongst the top three. Uh, they produce about 5 million tons, but I think they trade about 10 million uh, tons a year. So refining and trading. Um, some of them are integrated. Uh, some are also based on sugar beet, not all on sugar cane. The European companies, uh, some of them are on sugar beet. Uh, then we've got uh, our neighbors in Thailand, Midwall, who is ranked number seven. So in the region, uh, which I'll touch a little bit more, uh, it's basically competition from uh, Thailand uh, and a some, some uh, but very small uh, ex export uh, competition from Indonesia. Okay. This is the Malaysian uh, sugar industry. Uh, so it's MSM and CSR. Uh, MSM has the largest uh, share. And we've got, as I mentioned, Pry and Johor. So we see per list. Uh, CSR has the uh, uh, in Shah Alam, this, uh, the 600,000 ton per year plant, and also in the north, Gula Padang Terak. So um, we have about 60% share and MSM, uh, sorry, we have about 60% share and CSR about 40%. Uh, the export capacity out of, uh, out of Malaysia is 1.33 million. Yeah. Um, okay. In terms of household brands, so uh, this is a report by Kanta, a leading UK. Uh, Shima, Shima, Shima. Uh, this is a report by Kanta, a leading UK based data insights uh, consultant with 30,000 people across 100 countries. So uh, after Maggie and Milo uh, by, in, by in the Nestle group, uh, Gula Pry ranks third, third most popular, third most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, with the household, household penetration. Uh, of 70.9%. So if, for your info, in Malaysia, households are uh, about 6 million, and we have a, a 4.2 uh, million household penetration. So we have wider outreach. Uh, so as you can see, within the top 10, uh, CSR is not among the top 10 uh, brands, so it's cooler pride. Uh, we have also group company Saji at number number seven. In terms of board of directors, so this is a new board of directors. Two of them have been uh, have been uh, quite some time with us, but I'll start with uh, the chairman, Dr. Hisham. 
Dr. Sai Hisham, uh, he he was formerly the uh, CEO of the of the uh, of the first Proton uh, setup. He's now uh, also a board member of Sirim and uh, so forth. Um, so he's chairman uh, since uh, mid last year. Then we've got Dato Rosini and uh, Dato Lim. So this has been uh, somewhat a uh, board member uh, for, for quite a number of years in MSM. So they know the history of MSM. Other new board members, Dato Hapis, uh, he's Petronas. Uh, he was ex uh, Petronas and uh, he's all, he was also formerly from Dow, Dow, Dow Chemicals. Um, then you've got Dato Muntana, so he's a legal by background, and also he sits in Digital Malaysia. Uh, then we've got Mr. Stephen Choi. So Mr. Stephen Choi is uh, heading up the uh, audit committee, and also he is a member of uh, Deutsche Bank. Maybe I've recently uh, stepped down after nine years, but he was very much involved in Deutsche Bank. Uh, Dato Amir, he represents KPF, which is part of uh, Felda. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm, I've been on board since uh, February this year. Uh, I come from the uh, energy industry as well as the Al Bukhari Group, a uh, few years in Al Bukhari Group. Um, then we've got Hasni Ahmad. Hasni Ahmad is from FGV, so he's Group Chief Operating Officer. And uh, Che Abdul Aziz, uh, the Group Chief Financial Officer. Uh, also uh, fairly new, uh, last two years. And then with Ms. Koo. Ms. Koo is a long-standing company secretary of about 30 years within the Felda uh, FGV group. Chia, Chia Pola is heading uh, MSM Price. So Chia has, uh, is one of the long-service uh, uh, employees. So he's, he, has, he was he's with uh, Price since, uh, I mean, for the last 26 years. Yeah? And it's not uncommon to find in Pry, uh people between 20 to 30 years of, uh, of uh, long service. And then we've got Asmawi Arifin uh, at the bottom uh, left. So he was heading MSM uh, per list that we that I mentioned we seized the uh, uh, middle of last year. So he's heading up uh, Johor, a very young dynamic uh, person for the Johor turnaround. Then we've got uh, Jay Abdul Hadi, who's here uh, today with us, and he's heading corporate strategy. Hadi has been also a uh, few years with, uh, with MSM. And then Aniza is heading legal, and she's from the FGB group. Uh, and then Mr. Firaus on corporate governance, and uh, Mr. Bhaktia on group uh, human resource. He is coming from the energy industry. He uh, spent his time with Total, and also Tanku Haida. Tanku Haida is heading a uh, group commercial. Yeah. So in terms of uh, shareholding, as I mentioned, the institutional shareholdings are still very much the dominant shareholding of uh, MSM. Uh, what and also we have Pomodalan National Berhad. Uh, under Amana Raya trustees, so they are 9.43 percent. Yeah, um, <coughs> interesting to note that the number of shareholders in uh, MSM have grown from last year to this year by over 3,000. So it shows that uh, there is new attraction to MSM, new interest, and we are working hard to to convey the message of the turnaround and the transformation in uh, MSM. In terms of structure, um, so. Pry is still still there, uh, together with MSM Logistics. Uh, we have MSM Perlis, which is under divestment. Uh, you may have read that uh, we are selling uh, MSM Perlis under share sale agreement to uh, parent company uh, FGV. So that's ongoing. Uh, then we've got Johor, of course. Then MSM Trading is is somewhat dormant now, but we have uh, plans to to activate MSM Trading in terms of consolidation of uh, of uh, Sales and uh, trade, and uh, we'll we will we will be part of the uh, um, let's say the uh, reshaping of uh, MSM, yeah, uh, somewhat like a Petronas uh, Dagangan uh, type of a setup. And then we've 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 got MSM International Trading in Dubai once upon a time, but it's under liquidation right now, so it's part of the cleanup. Okay. So our journey since 1964. Uh, so um, this is uh, Pry started with Pry. Then the acquisition by FGV from the Quark Group in 2009. Um, hence, you can see the close relationship we have with uh, with uh, Quark Group via Wilma until until today. So we've got good good collaboration. Um, MSM uh, was listed on KLSE in 2011. Uh, 2014 was a good record-breaking uh, year in terms of profit, 260 uh, 257 million to be exact. Uh, we have. Uh, we have our crosshairs, uh, you know, uh, on on getting back to those glorious days, 
and I believe we can do it. Uh, we suffered eight, eight consecutive quarterly losses as a result after Johor was being built. Of course, it had, uh, had the new management, uh, the opportunity two or three years, then we would have done things differently. But nevertheless, uh, we have we know exactly where are the pinch points, the pain points, and we are working uh, in, in strategic steps to, to recover and uh, to, to improve the Johor plan. So that's well underway. And hence, you can see the result, the outcome of it. For quarter four, uh, we turned to black. In fact, the quarter, quarter uh, sorry, uh, 2020 was a profitable year. Uh, it's only because of the impairment from the uh, discontinuing operations of, uh, of uh, police uh, to the tune of 71 million. So impairment of 71 million had to be equated in the in, in the books. Uh, quarter one of 21, we, we, we again, we confirm the, uh, the, the turnaround is on track. So with, with, uh, with a profit uh, of 44, almost 44 million uh, PBT against a budget of almost 24 million. So uh, we we are on track, and soon you will you, you will hear about quarter uh, quarter two, uh, or rather half one result. So half one we uh, are on track to exceed exceed our budget. Okay, go ahead. So these were the financial highlights. I think most of you know um, already. Um, so just to quickly recap, revenue is two point two billion. PBT was uh, 20, 36 million. Total assets two point eight billion. Production at uh, over a million exports. So exports is it, exports is an area that we are focused on, and we want to grow it. So we want to grow it to thirty percent, and uh, at least it's uh, it's it's almost there now. Uh, and we will do it in a sustainable manner. One day, perhaps we will reach uh, fifty percent in terms of once we improve Johor and so forth. We'll reach to about fifty percent uh, in terms of export in our portfolio. Uh, utilization is this is a blended utilization, forty seven percent price normally about 75% uh, to 80%. Uh, Johor is still, as, uh, as we said, because of its uh, early, uh, early issues, uh, it's below 30%. But by end of this year, we hope to get Johor and we, we, we believe we, we can because we know, we understand already what are the main issues and we will get it, uh, get it to about 50% by this year. Next year, we will hit about 60 to 65%. And in 2023, we get it to a prior level. So uh, meaning, all that Pride can do, Johor will be able to do fully also in 2023. So this is the plan moving forward. And then a net assets about 225, uh, being ranked number three as mentioned, and refining yield. So this is the efficiency of the plan. Uh, so we, we we are a decent number, but still we've got headroom uh, to work towards 96, 97%. Okay. <clears throat> so in terms of, uh, of uh, we are premium quality. At the bottom, uh, bottom uh, left. Uh, so we have a poll percentage of 99.6 percent. So polarization percentage is a is a measure of the sucrose levels in uh, sugar. Just to put it in, in simple terms. So there is a premium to to Gula Pride uh, or MSM sugar in, in in the market. So those industry players who know they they are willing to pay uh, a premium for this, meaning that they will be using less sugar in their production using our sugar um, of course it's a uh, ikamsa 45 um, uh, standard um, we produce cost and fine and also a, a range of varieties uh, brown uh, icing custard and so forth value added products we have liquid sugar sugar so this is an interesting uh, uh, area of growth uh, liquid sugar so this is largely exported to china and we've started to sell uh, in the domestic market uh, so we have lines in uh, in Johor that we uh, for the uh, uh, commission, and we'll be putting up a, a concerted plan to increase the value added products. So this includes also fine syrup. So fine syrup, for example, we have exported to uh, New Zealand, and then uh, premix. Premix is uh, highly demanded in China. So what pre premix is an ingredients business, uh, where you take 88 or 90 percent of uh, sugar and mix with cocoa or glucose. Uh, we have exported largely the glue, uh, sorry, the uh, cocoa sugar mix uh, into China. So we've got we've got serious plans to grow the premix uh, business, um, and then we've got also health health angles to products. We need a bit more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, brand promotion, 
uh, we have not done so well on the health health segment, but moving forward, uh, we, we will do something differently uh, with our health products, go half and go natural. Um, customers, we mentioned uh, the numbers, but here uh, I'd like to just share with you that we have the modern trade. So these are your Tesco's, your Giant, your Midens and so forth, the big ones, as well as the tier two type of uh, chains, uh, Ilius Mart, KK Mart, 99 Speed Mart, yeah, Checkers and so forth. Um, and then, of course, we've got the wholesalers. So we've got big wholesalers, mid-size and small wholesalers. So we cover the full uh, geographical market of uh, Malaysia. Uh, and then, of course, we do directly ourselves uh, the distribution to FMCGs, the big 14 and the SMIs. Uh, and customer segment-wise, uh, we are 45% uh, wholesale. Uh, maybe it's a little bit low now because of the MCO. Uh, that's why there's more on the industry. Uh, but nevertheless, during MCO, uh, we see a stable uh, stable volume of 1.5 million tons per year in demand uh, from uh, MCO to MCO, right? Okay. So a bit of financial performance. I uh, won't go too much into the details, uh, but here just to emphasize and stress that you can see the turnaround from 2019 to 2020. So you can see that the uh, curve is moving upwards uh, and it will continue to move uh, upwards. Yeah. Um, later in the Q and A, if you have any questions, uh, Aziz is here. He can uh, he'll be happy to share with you a bit more. So as mentioned, it is only the barrel plant uh, issue of uh, impairment uh, of seventy one million that uh, otherwise it would have been a profitable year. Okay, uh, next. <clears throat> so in terms of, uh, of uh, the uh, average selling price, so this has grown by eight percent and refining costs uh, has come down margins have improved so these are some of the key elements uh, moving forward so we 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 have uh, strategically uh, moved the average selling price at least in, in the wholesale segment closer to the gazetted selling price i have a we have a slide on on that which i can share with you so we have moved uh, towards the uh, gazetted selling price ceiling the ceiling gazetted ceiling uh, accorded by the government. Uh, that, that, that's key. That's key to the uh, to the uh, financials uh, performance of uh, MSM, right? Okay. <clears throat> so this was just a re reflection of the uh, quarter four. So the one in bold, fifty six uh, million, uh, was recorded in uh, quarter four. Yeah. Um, okay. Can move on. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, if you can see, quarter on quarter, year on year, uh, quarter, 43 versus a loss of 27 million. So um, this is, uh, this is again, uh, proving the turnaround of, uh, of MSM. Of course, quarter, quarter two, you will see a bit of challenges in terms of uh, we had to uh, improve Johor. So we took a concerted step to improve Johor. So hence, uh, Johor was not uh, producing for, for, for over slightly over a month. Uh, we've got now uh, one of the boilers back on track. We've got the second boiler coming back uh, soon. Uh, so that was part of the plan. And uh, but nevertheless, quarter two is still is still a decent a decent uh, profit, which we will be announcing uh, quite 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 soon. Um, gearing ratio. So we have a discipline to pare down that. Uh, so and it will be part. It will be part and parcel of um, of the forward plans. So gearing ratio today is about uh, 30 percent, and we will we will reduce borrowings uh, further moving ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so raw sugar New York 11. I think you will hear more from uh, from uh, my colleague Karim, uh, who will be speaking uh, on this. In a nutshell, we have hedge. Uh, as far as uh, 2021, we have largely hedge for the wholesale market. For the industries, it's a it's a pass through. It's a back to back. Uh, so, uh, so we have covered ourselves for for this year. We have started hedging for 2022 uh, against the bullish market. Uh, it's a fairly decent hedge, 37 percent between 15 to 16 percent. Currently, uh, sugar is about I think slightly over 18 percent, 18 cents now. Uh, and of course, we'll hear from from Karim's view about the the sugar moving ahead. For your for your info, break even for MSM at the current gazetted ceiling is uh, 20.5 20, cents. So we still got uh, headroom to manage. Yeah. Um, okay. There are weather weather issues uh, surrounding uh, Brazil and Thailand. 
So uh, Brazil is not just about dry weather. So we read recently also about the frost. So the rigid uh, uh, weathers that are, will be affecting crops. Um, yeah, Thailand also has, has weather issues. And, uh, and uh, Brazil, uh, not only on weather, but they are also uh, having to support the methanol, uh, sorry, the uh, ethanol program uh, locally. Yeah, so um, the sugar millers have the option. So when crude prices uh, increase, sugar millers uh, have the option of, uh, of supporting and gaining more probably uh, income on, on the ethanol programs. Uh, hence, that's all uh, you know, contributing to the less sugar in the market. And with this, I'd like to say also that freight costs, uh, we had a spike in freight costs uh, in quarter two, it's, though it's coming down, but still uh, we have to, to, to be able to manage the freight, freight costs uh, moving, moving ahead. Okay. Right. This is on Forex. So Forex, uh, we've managed uh, fairly, fairly well. So we've got four for half one of this year, 4.07 against a market average of uh, uh, 4.15. Uh, and we've started to hedge for quarter three. We think we think the ringgit will will continue to weaken. Uh, we don't see any impetus. Uh, I don't know. Maybe perhaps all of you can share your opinions uh, during this discussion. Uh, however, to uh, in order to avoid forex uh, exposure, we will be increasing our U.S. dollar trade lines. So we will make strong effort in uh, getting our U.S. dollar trade lines so that we will not need to be exposed to the to the swings. Okay. Right. So as mentioned earlier about the gazetted ceiling price. So for refiners, the ceiling price is 2.69 ringgit uh, uh, per kilogram. So in tons, that's 2,690 per ton. And then we've got wholesalers who has uh, 8 cents on, on, on the kilo uh, uh, gazetted by the government. And also for the retailers, they have another 8 cents. So on the shelf, uh, you'll find two ringgit 85 cents per kilo. So two years ago, it, uh, the price was uh, reduced by, I think, 10 cents. Uh, so it may warrant a slight increase in case New York 11 continues to be uh, sustainably bullish. So government is, uh, the commentary on the ministry is uh, uh, keeping close watch on uh, that. And of course, joint industry is in uh, close discussions with them. Uh, so, but in the region uh, and also globally, Malaysia uh, sugar retail price is still amongst the cheapest. Yeah, uh, you can see largely the rest are three ringgit fifty cent equivalent and above. Of course, Thailand has come down, uh, so they are about Malaysia. Okay. Um, so a bit about the share share price. Uh, as you know, five year high was five 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 oh five ringgit. Uh, Today, in the last in the last 52 weeks, the share price uh, uh, had a high of 2209. So right after we released quarter four results, uh, we had a euphoria, a kind of a euphoria in the last uh, over over a few weeks, chasing the MSM shares. So chased it all the way up from uh, 56 cents. Uh, I remember 56 cents to two ringgit nine cents, and then it receded uh, to 170. Uh, and it was staying around that 170 level. Uh, it's only because of one of the foreign share, uh, shareholders among the top 30 shareholders. I think for macro reasons, not for MSM reasons, because we have no among analysts, we have no sell calls, only buy and hold. Uh, so it was for macro reasons. And I think at that time, COVID, uh, COVID statistics spiked uh, more than 7,000 cases per day. So I think that uh, were impetus or spooked the uh, foreign investors to trigger a sell. So about 30 million shares uh, were traded in a very short period. So that caused the dip from 170 to around uh, 120. Uh, now it's about 130, 130 plus uh, recovery. So it's a good dip. It's a it's a it's a dip that is a buying opportunity, uh, if I may add. Okay, right. Uh, so these are the consensus as mentioned. So uh, uh, to our good host today, M, M Invest, uh, who has a target price of 215, and all the way to uh, on the on the far right, MIDF at 196. So we have a range. Okay. So of course everybody can uh, can share their opinions, uh, but nevertheless, uh, what's consistent is that uh, there's no sell call 
on uh, MSM. So I think the market, the investing market recognized the turnaround. I think this is most important. And for the level of price it is today, we believe there's also capital appreciation uh, headroom uh, besides uh, yield, uh, yield potential. Uh, you know that MSM is backed by a 50% dividend policy. So this year is going to be, uh, we, we believe, uh, a, a strong profitable year, not only from operational profit, but also from the extraordinary profits of the monetization of the non-core assets. Okay. So this is the monetization of a non-core asset, the main one. So this is MSM per list. So we have published this news uh, in the media and to and a release to Bursa. So we expect again from the 175 million ringgit transaction, we expect a gain of 91.6 million ringgit. You know, uh, so we will we will we will decide. But largely, this this I believe will go priority to reduce debt as well as to supporting dividend payments. But this is the decision of the board. And we've got uh, we've got uh, with us uh, uh, the uh, Afin Huang uh, as the investment uh, bank. Uh, sorry, the independent advisor. And uh, and uh, the conclusion and uh, issuance of the report is that it's fair, reasonable, and not detrimental to to the minority shareholders. Okay. I don't know if Asni is here, uh, but uh, yes, I mean don't, don't say. Ah, Hasni, okay. So uh, maybe this part I'll let Hasni, because uh, Hasni has been uh, strategic uh, with the Johor turnaround. So I'll let him explain in detail. Okay, thank you, Donsei. Uh, in terms of the uh, optimization, uh, basically we embark on six uh, key initiatives at MSM Johor. Uh, the first one is that the, um, we execute a detailed ramp up plan, uh, focus on um, basically the bottlenecking. Uh, we have engaged a con several consultants to look into the plan. And then the, um, the first step that we uh, executed is that we, uh, we have a downtime for boiler. Uh, we already fixed the boiler number one. And by middle of uh, end of August, we complete boiler number two. So that one basically the basic uh, thing that we need to uh, remedy in terms of Johor uh, to move forward. Uh, Second of yield improvement and reduce uh, production losses. Uh, so in Q1, we achieved the highest uh, yield, uh, 92%, still a long way to, get, to go. Uh, the benchmark is to achieve uh, on par with uh, PRI, but 96.5. So basically what we have done, so, uh, we look into the whole process, understand where the losses is, and then basically put a plan in place to mitigate the losses that uh, basically contribute to the uh, better yield that we achieve in uh, Q1. And the next one is uh, on increased value added product sales. Uh, we basically double up our uh, liquid sugar uh, uh, plant. And that's basically both for uh, export and also for local market. Uh, we also improve our uh, fine syrup. And also as uh, um, uh, Tansai mentioned, we look into the premix. So those are basically value added product that we want to expand uh, the production in uh, Johor. Uh, the third one is look into the organization structure and high performance culture. Um, so basically, we what we have done for the last six months, look into the uh, key role. Uh, for example, our uh, uh, HR, safety, because I think our um, objective is that the first is safety, uh, second is quality, and the third one, we can run the operation. So based on fundamental, we are able to put together the uh, organization in place and currently executing based on that uh, fundamental operation. Uh, the third one is on the increased SKU. Um, and when the Johor was built, it's more on the bulk uh, business. So we kind of want to tailor me Johor to also support the domestic mm -hmm. market. So we installed and commissioned uh, two units of one metric ton, uh, four units of uh, one kg packing line into the existing system. And I think by next year, we're gonna uh, basically relocate another five unit of uh, SKU uh, one kg from police. So they basically give us uh, Joho similar to what we have in uh, police moving forward. And lastly, we, uh, we want to improve our data recording for better management control. So basically on the way here, we basically automate that uh, um, system, have a proper monthly calibration. And so far we see a lot of uh, uh, mitigate all the losses that we see previously. 
And the next step is you want to move to uh, the smart manufacturing. So that's basically uh, industrial 4.0. OK, that's all for me, Tosei. OK, thank you, Asni. So moving forward plans. Um, so moving forward, so part of the, uh, you know, to make Johor sustainable is to increase our export. <coughs> Yeah, and yeah, we've already got good good momentum on this. Um, so if you look at the uh, uh, top ten countries, the the five Vietnam, Singapore, South Korea, China, New Zealand, uh, this represents already more than eighty five percent of our volume into those markets. Yeah, uh, half half of these volumes are into Vietnam. So we like the Vietnamese market. We believe uh, Singapore. We can do much more in uh, Singapore. So Singapore, you know, inherently is a two hundred fifty thousand tons per year market. Uh, and Johor is just next door. So it's a strategic uh, vantage point for MSM uh, Johor to penetrate uh, Singapore. Uh, South Korea is uh, is also a customer. Uh, China, and uh, we believe that China, we can do much more in uh, in uh, in China. Uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, it's more on the value added products. So like the fine syrups. Uh, so we are into the New Zealand market as well. Of course, we export to other countries. Uh, Philippines, uh, Pakistan, and so forth. And we will also look closely into Indonesia. In terms of value-added products, uh, China is there uh, as, as the main market for us. Okay. So this is the three-year strategic uh, turnaround plan. Uh, I know the slide looks a bit busy, but uh, let, let's focus first on, uh, on the, uh, far, no, on the, uh, on the uh, far left, the turnaround. So this is a turnaround plan. So as I mentioned, the average selling price is key, and uh, we have stabilized selling at the gazetted ceiling price. So this is important point. Secondly, uh, the elements of cost. New York 11, we have managed to hedge, and we have good hedging skills, and where we just do not take decisions on our own, but we do also consultations with experts, one of them namely being uh, Wilma. So we also take uh, take heed, take input from uh, expert advice. So today I would say that our buying and managing of raw sugar is, is fairly decent, very well. Uh, freight will be another area that we manage. Uh, and, uh, energy, of course, it's 70% uh, of refining costs. So if you remove uh, raw sugar, 70% of refining costs is energy. So we have to have good management of our, our energy. Currently, it's gas. And we'll be looking into LNG futures as part of the uh, of the uh, way to improve managing uh, costs of this. And then, of course, we will look at uh, increasing utilization and the yields. So, as Asni mentioned, so Johor is underway. So we have the target of 50%. Then we also uh, rebalancing, as Asni mentioned, between Johor and Prai. Uh, so this is to take advantage of the geographical location. So hence, S and D selling and distribution costs is a key element. So uh, we will uh, take advantage of Johor being there to serve the southern region. That means Johor, Melaka, parts of Negris Milan and lower parts of Pahang. And also that we find it's cheaper to ship to East Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak from Johor. So, uh, so this is about the coverage for Johor. Um, and then we have consolidated wholesalers. So we have uh, put them on proper tiering and a proper geographical uh, demarcation. Uh, and we will increase from our 60% uh, domestic share to 65%. So this is in progress. And we will uh, handle direct contracts uh, more for FMCGs and uh, SMIs. And we'll grow the exports, as mentioned, value-added products as well, continue to pay down debts. And also, uh, with any reasonable offer of, uh, of uh, partners who want to take equity in Johor, you may have read in the article and maybe some of your questions uh, after this, uh, it will be evaluated based against offtake guarantee. So there must be value to this besides a monetary uh, divestment. Um, so without the offtake guarantee, it will be meaningless uh, to, to look at any, uh, any such uh, proposal. Now, uh, in the middle, resilience. So this is the, uh, for 2022. We'll continue uh, to grow the, uh, enhance the export markets into Indonesia, rest of ASEAN, and also Pacific. We'll expand the value-added products and also to uh, to to institute uh, research and development, especially if you want to look into health se segments and other sugar products. And then we look at income diversification, uh, as mentioned, the premix business. So the ingredients market is uh, is really attractive. Uh, so that would be an area of focus. We also look at OEM, 
So we believe sugar, sugar-based OEMs, cordials and condensed milks are also attractive, and we have plans working towards it. Uh, then manage, managing energy besides the LNG futures, we also look into uh, green energy like solar and potentially biomass. And uh, in the transformation program, uh, digitalization of MSM is key, and that's IR 4.0. So IR 4.0 is across all aspects of the business, from sales to uh, to manufacturing to logistics and all supporting services. Yeah, and 23, uh, we will unlock further MSM. So it's a maturity of uh, MSM Johor towards a prior level, as mentioned. And then we look at greater opportunities in the downstream. We will grow the exports to about 50% of portfolio. We will look at uh, distributorship in uh, certain target, targeted ASEAN countries. We'll expand logistic capabilities. So here, since uh, freight is, an, is also an element that we notice uh, that needs to be closely managed, we'll look at chartering opportunities of vessels. So vessels charter is part of the program. Uh, and then we'll explore uh, capacity growth overseas. So we don't need to build a plan uh, to, to, to expand capacities. We can take uh, offtake agreements overseas if needed and under the MSM uh, quality management. So similarly to a Nike or Adidas who can uh, can make their sneakers in, uh, in Indonesia or Vietnam, but it is still a Nike or Adidas quality. So we'll take that kind of an approach. And in, in line with the vision of MSM, we are not restricted to just sugar. Perhaps one day, if, if, if we find that essential food products in other, other areas are, are feasible and profitable, makes sense for MSM, and we, we will closely, we'll be open to it. Okay. So the, uh, I'll conclude uh, the, the presentation with uh, some message that it's a new board, it's a new board, it's a new management. Yeah, so uh, forget all the old stigmas of uh, MSM. Uh, that no longer, that's all behind us. Uh, we have stronger governance and we are in the process of transformation and aggressive transformation. Uh, the turnaround is happening. You've seen it, quarter four, quarter one. Uh, soon you will also hear of uh, quarter two. And uh, we believe that the profitability will be sustained. Uh, you have any questions, Mr. Aziz is here also to, to, to reaffirm that. Uh, resilience. So we are, you are in, we are in a sugar business. So sugar is a, is an essential food. So hence, uh, uh, even you have some uh, shocks uh, in, in terms of global crisis or even regional crisis, sugar is still part of an essential food product. So there is inherent resilience in that industry itself. Uh, and then we are poised for for dividends, as mentioned, and is backed up by policy. And we believe that. This year onwards, we can uh, uh, investors will enjoy uh, good yields, and then there's a significant uh, upside on capital appreciation. So currently, as mentioned, that the there is a dip in MSM shares. It's a it's, it's a potential opportunity. So with that, I thank you and uh, I hand it back to uh, to Farida. Thank you, Mr. Aziz. Thank you, Tuan Sai. Now I would like to invite Mr. Karim, Head of Sugar Market Analysis, for his presentation on the topic. Mr. Karim, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Okay, thank you. I will try to then to share my slides on my side, but if I don't use it, maybe uh, because my, maybe my connection is not good enough. So maybe you can you can do that for me. Let me. <clears throat> sure, I can do that for you, Mr. Karim. Let me try, but uh, yeah, if you. No problem. I'll project the screen for you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can you see the screen? Uh, not yet. Can everyone see the screen? I can see. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, can see screen. Yes, can see the screen. Thank you. Um, Mr. Karim, maybe would you like to check your connection? <laughs> ah, it's okay. Now. Okay. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, uh, obviously, I thank you for, uh, for inviting me to this presentation. 
it's uh, it's an honor to be to be there with you and it's uh, also an honor to be uh, to be a partner of uh, MSM as you as you rightly mentioned so it's uh, it's a great privilege to be to be there uh, i will do a, a presentation with i will start with some basic information about the sugar market just to put some numbers in uh, in uh, in head for those who are not familiar with, with the sugar market and then i will uh, give you some insight about the, the drivers of the sugar prices for the next uh, few months, if you don't, if you don't mind. And the, and obviously, I will be uh, open to any kind of kind of question. Uh, I guess I will uh, try to reply to to most of them if I if, if I can. Uh, on this world sugar map, it's just to put in perspective uh, where the sugar production and the sugar exporters are located. So in blue, you have the you have the exporters, uh, the main one being Brazil uh, in terms of, uh, of, of export and in terms of surplus. Uh, then you have also Australia, Thailand, obviously, which are the main, uh, the main exporters. You have India, uh, which is an exporter also, uh, and especially this year. And you, are, you also have, in a certain extent, uh, European, European Union and the Eastern countries like uh, Russia and, and Ukraine, and also South Africa and the South East of um, Africa. In in orange, you have the deficit countries, and you have the which means the importing countries. And obviously, uh, it's where you don't have production. Mostly, it's mostly Africa, Middle East. You have a, a large deficit of uh, sugar production in in Africa, Middle East, and also Asia, Far East Asia in general, and and China. So you have two blocks. I mean, uh, U.S. and Canada are also, and, and Eastern Europe are also in deficit, but to a lower extent. So you have two blocks of, uh, of trade, I would say, which is which are mainly uh, Africa and Middle East countries and uh, and Far East. As a world, uh, sugar production is estimated around 190, 85 million tons, and the sugar consumption is more or less equivalent. It's what 100. 87 million tons in 2021, 2021. And the trade, the total trade, the sugar which is traded is around about 60, 60 million tons in 2020, 2021. And, and, uh, and, uh, and you mentioned rightly that to Wilmar, we trade about 10 to 12 million tons of, of sugar, which is a fair uh, market share of uh, around 20%. Can, can we go to the next slide, please? So here it just, uh, I think you will have access to all the numbers, or at least I can send it to you, of course, but uh, nothing is confidential at this stage. So I will not go into all the details. It's just to show you that the main, num the main producers are Brazil, uh, with a production of uh, estimated of 33 million tons uh, of sugar. India, uh, just slightly below, uh, European Union, which is a, uh, in my slide, or in our numbers, consider as as a country, which is not a country, of course, but it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a union of countries. Thailand, uh, Thailand is a leading producer in uh, in Asia, uh, with a production of close to 10 million tons uh, this year, and and China, the, the production in China is more or less steady, around 10 million tons. What we can see on this slide, I mean, it's the evolution of the production from the past few years, which is which are quite interesting for the main for the main ones. For example, you have Brazil. If you look at Brazil two years ago, the production in, Bra in Brazil was 26 million tons. Last year, it was 38 million tons. So you had a big jump in Brazilian production. I will explain you why. Because there is a, a, a huge flexibility for the millers to produce sugar or to produce ethanol. And then this year, the production is is back to 33 million tons, and we will see that we will probably reduce these numbers because of the weather situation in Brazil, which is very, very difficult with a lot of growth and, uh, and frost. India also, India, the production is quite, quite huge. The production in India is steadily, steadily above 30, 30 million tons from the past five years, uh, which is in excess because the consumption in India is around 25 million tons. So, so you have a regular excess of five to six million tons of sugar production produced in India. 
Thailand, uh, European Union is more or less steady. Thailand is also interesting because if you look at Thai production in 2018-19, it was close to 15 million tons. And then it has been half by, uh, it has been divided by two, nearly two. Last year, the production was 7.4 million tons and the production is increasing back to close to 10 million tons in 2021-22, but it is quite far from the record production we had in 2017-18. So just to show you that you have a lot of uh, volatility in the production, especially in Brazil, also in Thailand, and uh, India is becoming a, a leading uh, sugar producer. Can we go to the next slide, please? In terms of exporting countries, just one point to notice, or one or two points to notice, the, the two or three first one, uh, Brazil is a leading exporter in terms of sugar production, in terms of sugar, by far, that's the main point. Uh, Brazil is accounting for more than 50%, close to 60% of the sugar trade flows. On the, two, on the sugar flows, uh, we mentioned that the, the trade is around 60 million, 60 million tons, and Brazil, we expect Brazil to export out of these 26 million tons of sugar. So you can directly see that if there is a problem in Brazil, or if there is a, a, a crop problem in Brazil, it will impact the sugar market, as Brazil is predominant. The second one is, is India. India is, uh, is exporting more than five or more than six million tons of sugar from the past few years. And it's also a problem for the world market. We'll explain it uh, uh, very quickly later because this sugar is subsidized by Indian government. So it's not, it's not free market sugar. It's sugar with, uh, with a lot of subsidies. And uh, we, we estimate that the Indian government has granted about $2 billion of, uh, of subsidy from the past three years to export, uh, to export the sugar. And this uh, caused a, a lot of trouble in the sugar market. Thailand is also a leading sugar exporter, but to, to, a lower, to, lo, to a lower extent. Last year, they have exported only 3.8 million tons, and we expect uh, export from Thailand nearly to double in 2021-22. The rest is more or less steady. The biggest one are Brazil, India, Thailand, and, uh, and Australia, which is a, st a steady exporter of around 3.5 million tons of sugar per year. Can we go to the next slide, please? In terms of global S and D, uh, on, on this graph you have many many data. It's just you you have the the production curve, which is uh, in, in blue. The the consumption curve. It's the world production, the world consumption, and the surplus and deficit on a yearly basis. So you have the consumption curve in gray, um, the production curve in blue, and the difference. The columns are the years where you have surplus of sugar which means that when the production is over the consumption and or deficit of sugar when the consumption is, is uh, over the production. And you can see on this graph that from the past two years and maybe, if, and, and even we, it's also the same for next year in our forecast, we have a, a, pro, a world production lower than, than the world consumption despite, despite the COVID situation, which has obviously penalized the, the, the consumption. So we have, we have deficits, we have accumulated deficits from the past three years, and it explains why, explain why the market is going up and why the market is uh, quite, uh, quite strong on an historical basis, uh, as today we are close to 18.5 cents. Can we, go back, can we go to the next slide, please? So here you have the, the evolution of the sugar prices in, in New York from, uh, December, from early 2020. You can notice that the market uh, went down close to a very low level in April 2020. It was due to two main effects. Uh, the first one by far was the COVID, uh, the apparition of the, of the COVID-19 situation, uh, which was a, a big stress for the fi financial markets in general and for agricultural markets also and a lot of liquidation from the funds and from the uh, speculative community. Uh, you also have at the same period the start of the export subsidy from India, and India has decided to subsidize its export program uh, 
with a quota of 6 million tons. So this has uh, uh, put a lot of pressure on the, mar on the market. The market went down from 16 cents close to 9 cents in, in just in a couple of months. And then the market is quite well supportive. It's in, it's a, the, the trend is quite, quite bullish from uh, April 2020 due to the deficit situation we have. And today we are ranging between uh, 17 and, and 19 cents. Today the price is around 18.5 cents. We can see the, also in, uh, in February 2021, uh, the second effect of the export subsidy from India, and the market went down very quickly. When India has announced another quota of 6 million tons of export subsidy, the market went down from 19 cents uh, down to 14.8 cents in just in a couple of, uh, of months. Next slide, please. The situation in Brazil, Brazil, uh, Brazil is the leading producer, the leading exporter, so it's worth a few slides spe specifically on Brazil. There is a big deficit of water in, in Brazil from the past uh, 12 months. So on this graph, you have the rainfall situation in Sao Paulo states, which is the main producing state in Brazil compared to the average situation and compared to, to, uh, to the range to the minimum and the maximum uh, rainfall accumulated. So we have a big deficit of uh, between 40 and 45% in all Sao Paulo states and all the other states are nearly to the same situation in, in Brazil. On top of this, we had uh, several frost experiences uh, in Brazil uh, recently. So we had frost uh, last week. There are frost uh, expected uh, by the end of the month, so maybe tomorrow and, uh, and uh, by the end of the week. And we also had a, 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 a first frost in the beginning of July. So the situation is very difficult in Brazil. It's historically, historically low. We've never seen such a, a deficit in terms of, uh, of precipitation, in terms of rainfalls. And the yields, the agricultural yield in Brazil, I expect it to be a record low. Can, can we go to the next one? So we expect a very uh, huge drop in production. Uh, on this graph, you have many data, but uh, I will just uh, focus on the, on, on the first line, maybe on the first line and, and, and the last one. Uh, last year, the total cane sugar production, because obviously you, you start to crush cane to produce sugar. Last year, the total cane sugar production was around 600 5 million tons of cane to produce 38.5 million tons of sugar. Now we think that downside scenario is probably five, 510 million tons of cane. So we, we may lose about 100 million tons of cane in Brazil from one year to another. Uh, and we may lose about 7.5 million tons of sugar production from one year to another, which is quite Quite, quite large. It's very large. It's, uh, it's equivalent, 100 million tons of cane, it's equivalent to the total uh, sugar cane production in Thailand, for example. So we may lose between 2020 and 21 and, and this year, which is starting in Brazil because the crop starts in April and ends in uh, November, we may lose the equivalent of the total uh, production in Thailand. So it's a tremendous change. It's, it's a real change. And total export should, should really decrease in Brazil from nearly 30 million tons in, uh, in 2020-21 down to 23 million tons in 2021-22. Can we go to the next slide, please? On top of this, uh, on top of this there is another uh, issue in Brazil, uh, is the flexibility of the mills. In fact, when you, just to, to make it quick, when you crush cane, when you are a producer in Brazil, you have the, the, you have the ability to produce either sugar or ethanol. You can crystallize your sugar juice, and then you, you start to produce sugar juice. You can crystallize your sugar, su sugar juice to produce uh, sugar uh, with the crystallization, or you can uh, use your su sugar juice to produce ethanol. Then you go to the fermentation process and to the uh, production of <coughs> to the distillation process and on, on the return between sugar and ethanol. So in, in, in theory, the millers in Brazil are comparing the price of ethanol with the price of sugar, and they decide if they will maximize sugar production 
or if they will maximize ethanol production in function of the of the parities. So you can see, for example, on this graph between uh, Jan 2020 and 18 up to April 2020, uh, ethanol production, ethanol prices were high in, in blue and gray were higher than sugar prices in, in red. And then the millers in Brazil, they have maximized ethanol production and reduced sugar production consequently. Last year, it was the opposite. Sugar prices were higher than ethanol prices, so they have maximized sugar production in Brazil. That's why you had a we had a production of 38.5 million tons of sugar production in Brazil. And this year, it's a bit different. This year, uh, you can see from the beginning of the, uh, from April 2021, when the crop has started, sugar prices and ethanol prices are nearly the same. We don't have any more difference. And even ethanol is paying a little bit better than sugar from, from uh, time to time. So in theory, the millers should not maximize sugar production as they used to, be, to do it last year. And that's also a point which will probably penalize the sugar production in Brazil. Can we go to the next slide? In India, uh, in India, it's a, it's a bit different, as we said. As we said, so you have the evolution of sugar prices, sugar production in India. Uh, it's worth to note, uh, just on an historical basis, that just four or five years ago, in 2016-17, the production in India was around 20 million tons, and now the production in India is over 30 million tons. The production in India in 2020-21 was 31 million tons, and we expect the production next year to, to be at least to the same ex uh, level, probably close to 32 million tons of sugar production in 2021-22. And <clears throat> consequently, we have a, a, a large surplus of, uh, of sugar in India with large stocks in India, and this stocks and this surplus has to be exported. The problem of India is India in terms of sugar, in terms of uh, production cost, is not competitive to the world market. So this sugar uh, has some problem to be exported. You can see in, in 2016-17 or 17-18, even in 2017-18, when the production was 32 million tons, they struggled to export a lot of sugar. They have exported only 500,000 tons of sugar. But then from 2018-19, so two years ago, and last year also, uh, sorry, three years ago, uh, in 2019-20 and 2021, uh, the situation has changed in India, and the government has decided to resorb the stocks and to grant a lot of export subsidy. So they gave, it's what I told you in the beginning, the Indian government gave a total of $2 billion of subsidy to export sugar uh, in 2018, 19, 1920, 2021. And we think that they may continue to uh, offer subsidy uh, to, the, to the exporters in 2021-22. So... Uh, that's a, a, a real uh, distortion in terms of, uh, of the market. And, uh, and that's explain why, why, why the market went down uh, quite sharply uh, from time to time. Can we go to the next slide, please? So India is just to show you the balance sheet. So we expect a prediction for next year of around 31.5 million tons, so even higher than, than this year. Consumption is uh, around 26. And we think that they will continue to export at least 5 million tons of sugar, probably a bit more. And even though, if they, can, if they do that, the ending stocks will, will still be around 10 million tons of sugar. So it's, it's quite a lot to have 10 million tons of sugar in stocks. It's uh, five or six months of consumption because the consumption is around 25. So we, we do think that it will take time to, for India to resolve the stocks, uh, the huge stocks that, that they have and it will maybe take two or three years to, uh, to, to resolve all the stocks. Can we go to the next one, please? Thailand, very quickly, but it's, uh, it's the next door for you. So Thailand production is, uh, set, is, uh, will probably recover. We think that the production in Thailand will uh, go from 7.4 million tons close to 10 million tons. Uh, exports will also increase. Uh, obviously, they will have more, more sugar to export, but uh, nevertheless, we will be far from the situation we had in 2017-18 uh, or 2016-17 when the production in Thailand was close to, uh, was close to uh, 15 million tons. Next one, please. 
China, just to focus on China, because China uh, is one of the leading sugar importers uh, in the world. Uh, I didn't mention uh, importers and exporters to, uh, before in terms of numbers, but China is a leading importer. With the, the two leading importers in uh, on the world are very uh, are located in uh, in Asia. Uh, it's China and Indonesia. They both import um, more than five million tons of sugar on a yearly basis. So if you just take China and Indonesia, you have uh, nearly twenty percent of the total uh, uh, flows of, of sugar. In China, they, they, they used to imp they, they have imported last year. 6.3 million tons of sugar. We think that they will import at least 5 million tons in 2021-22, and it will continue. The production is, uh, is around 10 million tons uh, from the past uh, five years, and the consumption is, uh, is above 15 million tons. So you have a, a structural deficit gap of more than 5 million tons in, ch in China. They have huge stocks. They have huge stocks. They have uh, close to 14 million tons of stocks in China, which is nearly a, a, a full year of consumption. But in any case, uh, they will continue to import uh, between uh, five to six million tons of sugar on a yearly basis. Can you go to the next one, please? The freight, you mentioned the freight. The freight is a real problem. The freight uh, market uh, has more, uh, has, has tripled or even more. The freight market is a real issue. Uh, for the bulk cargoes, but also for the containers, uh, for the containers, and this uh, put a problem for the. This probably uh, slowed down a little bit the demand, but in any case, and uh, has probably increased the, the has surely increased the logistics for importers and and uh, and has penalized the trade. So we think that unfortunately the freight will remain probably a bit high for the next few months. Uh, there is a lot of demand. Uh, from China, uh, the situation is a bit unorganized in terms of, uh, of uh, on the freight market. Not unorganized, but in terms of containers, sorry. Uh, and we do think that the freight uh, will will, uh, will keep a, 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 a very dynamic demand for the for the next uh, few months. But it's a, it's an issue for importers, and as you mentioned uh, perfectly in your presentation, it's a part of your cost for uh, for for your for a refiner. Bull and bear flies for for on a midterm basis. Uh, what is clearly bull today, which is a uh, bull, is uh, uh, meaning that uh, we we think that the market may may uh, may be supportive. Uh, the drop situation is an issue in Brazil. It's an issue for this year, but I will say that it's also an issue for next year uh, because when you cut the cane, the ratoon, I mean the cane, which is uh, which is uh, uh, the, the next cane is starting to, to, to grow. And it's, it's a situation also for next year because the next crop in Brazil will be impacted uh, surely by the drop situation. The first risk, we mentioned it, uh, is, is, is present in Brazil and will continue. We, have, we, we are waiting for some risk problem by the end of the month. And it's, uh, for sure, it's, a, it's an issue in terms of, uh, of agricultural yields. So the crop in Brazil will disappoint. Uh, we we said that previously, so it's a, it's a, it's a fact. It's quite clear. The world uh, uh, SND, so supply and demand, is tight. We forecast a small deficit between production and consumption in 2021-22. We have a strong support from the ethanol market. Uh, I told you that the ethanol prices in Brazil are equivalent to, to 17 cents uh, for for sugar. Which means that if the sugar market is going down, it will be more interesting for the miller to produce ethanol than to produce sugar, and then they will produce less sugar. So the, the, the ethanol market is, is, a, is a strong support. And I would add, it's not in my presentation, but probably the crude oil market is also a support because today we, we, we saw that uh, we have a recovery of the world economy. Yes, it is in the presentation, sorry. We have a strong recovery of the world economy after the vaccination process and uh, the, the opening market. And the crude oil uh, market is probably a, a, bit, uh, a bit bullish as well and will probably drag with him uh, the commodities in general and sugar in particular. On the bear, on the bear flags, 
Um, many crops will, will recover anyway, so we will have a good production in India, that's, uh, that's a, a, a fact. We will have a good production in Thailand, we will have a good production in Europe. Uh, so you have a recovery uh, in, in many countries. As we used to say, the, the, best, the, the prices are the best fertilizers. So the, the crop will recover in many countries, in, in, in Russia as well, also in Ukraine. Um, we, we do think that we have the, the, the risk or the chance, I don't know whether you are a buyer or seller, but, but India may continue to subsidize massively its uh, export program. So we may, uh, we, we may see some uh, additional uh, subsidy coming from India, uh, which create a distortion in the market. The freight, as I said, is, is extremely high, but we think that it will penalize the flows, the import, the demand. We see uh, today that it's a bit difficult to, uh, to export white sugar to the different countries in, uh, in Africa, in Middle East, in East Africa. So the demand is a bit penalized by the logistics. Uh, and we, we think that there is still some stocks uh, to reserve, either at destination or at, uh, at origin. So my view uh, on, on this is that, uh, if we make a synthesis, is that I do think that the market uh, is in a range. I don't think that the market has a lot of reason to, to, to go down today uh, because it's well supported by the, by the bull factor that we mentioned and by ethanol. Uh, if the market is going up, it will obviously attract more sugar from India. So I don't think that the market will either uh, spike, I would say, above 20 cents. So I don't think that the market will spike. I think the market will, will stay in a range with, between, uh, I would say, 17 to 19 cents or 16.5 to 19 cents. And it will depend, obviously, on the situation in Brazil and on the situation in India, which are the two main drivers of the sugar market. Just as a very quick conclusion, if I may, uh, if I may uh, interfere in your in your edge, uh, so we are very proud, as we said, to to uh, to be partner with MSM, and I can tell you that discussing with a lot of producers, with a lot of importers, I can tell you that your edging of 2020-21, which is uh, between 13 and 14 cents, is a very good performance. The market today at uh, 18.5 cents. And you have a very good edging on your on your position, and even for 2021-22, uh, between 15 and 16 cents, it's also a, a good edging. So uh, I can congratulate you for for your 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 risk management and your and your edging. Thank you very much. I'm over for for my presentation. And, uh, Thank you very much, Mr.